Welcome to Begins Night, and the conclusion to several running plot threads part of the main series, as it explores the incident that got Double's adventures rolling. This story was part of the 2009 Kamen Rider crossover film, Decade and Double, Movie War 2010. Why it was Movie War 2010 when it premiered in 2009 is anyone's guess. I just credit to being the asinine decision-making of Toei's worst producer, and move on. We are now looking at the entire movie war today. I'll leave Decade Final Chapter and the actual crossover battle of the film for when I actually get to Decade. They're more tied into his story anyways. Movie wars are kind of an interesting thing. They were started because of the Sentai vs. movies doing well after moving into theaters, and Toei wanted to do more crossover stuff. So started these things out with Deno Climax Deca. And while it shut out Cloverfield in Japan, and I'm glad for it, I hate J.J. Abrams movies. It was kind of terrible as its advertised crossover with Kamen Rider Kiva was a lie. They spend all of five minutes together in the film, making such little more than a glorified cameo. As this was a spring movie, it continues my thesis that all Toei spring movies suck. But thanks to Decade's run length and its intent to consolidate writer continuity down to one Earth for proper crossovers, Kamen Rider's production got shifted so the early side of the series, beginning with Double, aired in the fall, which is less stressful for scheduling. In comparison to Sentai vs. movies, where the crossover for good or bad is the entire event, Rider Movie Wars decided instead to have an act structure to them, allowing the just-finished series to have an epilogue wrapping out anything lingering, and the current show and early season big budget events, with the various characters then coming together to find a mutual thread which features them acting in full camaraderie. As opposed to S9 events where heroes fight for no justified reason. While the best has been Mega Max, not seen Heisei Generations yet to judge it, and cut into say I have now seen Heisei Generations, and it is good, but I find I still like Mega Max more. Sadly, only half of the films have been good, either Movie War Ultimatum or Genesis, the worst one depending on who you ask. The bad ones all having the commonality of not being written by individuals involved in writing those series. Bad Toei! Bad! Ultimately, Movie War 2010 is considered the one at the middle of the pack, and mainly due to Double's part of the film as it mattered to Double's ongoing story, which as I said, plays into Riku Sanjo's strength as a writer, now he uses continuity in media relating to his work to accent its main story. What holds the film back is Decade's part, matching how the rest of his show ended up a disappointment, as this was originally going to be his full finale movie wrapping his show. They'd even shot footage for that cut to advertise the film at the end of Decade for the full-on Rider War, but that was then discarded and they went with something entirely different. Personally, for me, Movie War 2010 still works as a larger film and giving closure to Decade and some of the best work Masahiro Inoue was allowed to do with the character. Plus, Shotaro and Philip are pretty much the only writer Tsukasa has encountered at this point that didn't try to kill him when they met, which shows why he'd prefer to work with the Neo Heisei crew following this. But it still retains a lot of the stupid from writer Shoji Onomura and producer Shinichiro Shirakura that I loathe. So... Mulligan. The director's cut I'm using more emphasizes Double's part in events anyways. Begins Night opens on a dark and snowy night in Futo. It's Christmas! Shotaro noting the occasion by putting on a hat to the aggravation of Sokichi Narumi. All important points when you remember how Double opened. This was a dream of Shotaro's, reminiscing on how everything started last year, as the anniversary of Sokichi's death nears, the rest of the Futo Irregulars having stopped by for a Christmas party. Well, personally, I'm puzzled to... Excuse me, what? Oh, right. For some reason, Japanese Christmas tradition is to dine on fried chicken. I never really understood that one. I just blame KFC. This party is interrupted with the appearance of a client and their case. <laughs> nah, this is a sitcom designed to implicitly invoke the feels. You're looking for the Shiroganes across the street. This is Asami Mutsuki, a pop idol whose dead sister Erika has risen from her grave. Impressive, since she died in a shipwreck and they never found the body. Nonetheless, Asami asked them to find her, and she's been seeing her for a full week now. Bah! 
Like we'd ever have a movie about normal people coming back from the dead. Incidentally, fuck coming Rider Tyson. But again, since the body was never found, Asami believes it really could be her sister, making Shotaro flash back to the incident and how they never found Sokichi. Investigation reveals this is not an isolated incident, lots of people having been seeing dead relatives. It's almost as if there is an epidemic, or a hole into hell is open because an evil organization has been experimenting on the spirit of a dead kid. This is actually a condemnation of Commodore Tyson I cut from my 2014 review of it because, Cal, it was really damn obvious to anyone who had seen this movie that they were ripping off Begins Night with its undead resurrection subplot. Well, Begins Night and Deno Final Countdown, really. Those movies are just a regurgitation of plot points done horribly. They've all been occurring in places of meaning, so graveyards and memorials are first on the investigate list, meaning a priest that had overseen the events. He did it! Even when I saw this originally, I guessed that. Still, this causes Shotaro and Akiko to see the dead woman, chasing her... only to meet a specter of death. And I will save them. By killing them. I will destroy Spira. I will save it. Of course, Shotaro determines this a dopant, engaging it as double, only for death to fade away, and another individual to enter the picture. So Kishi Narumi, rise. Welcome to the Black Lantern Corps. Skull fires on double, Akiko confused, and Shotaro paralyzed by his mentor's appearance, even as Philip tries to get him to fight. Because this can't be the real man standing before them. Sokichi condemns him with words he'd spoken to him earlier, proof to Shotaro that this is really him. And to Shotaro, that's enough to make him falter. All he's done, all he's achieved, all he's endeavored to live up to, and it's still not enough in the eyes of the man whose opinion mattered most. The Sonozakis revel in the amusement brought from this incident, Kirihiko confused from previously seeing Ryubi giving an old man a memory. And event tied to Decade's side of this incident, that actually makes more sense had the story segments not been flipped in their positions. But no, it still makes no goddamn sense. Death comes for Asami, the girl wanting to be with her sister, and willing to do anything for that reunion. Where Shotaro during this? Back on the island where this all began. A smashed building. Sokichi's grave. And Philip is there because... he knows Shotaro too well. Predicting this is where he'd go. Thus, we finally get to the Begins Night incident in full, flashbacky glory. Beginning not from its contractor, but Sokichi and Shotaro having already infiltrated this facility with a small case in their hands to rescue a person of interest for their clients, the Child of Fate, who is revealed to be Philip, the museum is abusing the hell out of to produce the Gaia memories. But before they can extract him, they're found out by Sayako as taboo, and surrounded by masquerades. Now, behold, the ultimate badass! This is where that 35 seconds thing I mentioned previously comes into play. So Kichi Narumi has the honor of fastest death of a common writer on record. From Movie War Core, we learned he's been active since 1999, predating Kuga in fact in Toei's timeline. But because the events of the series he was introduced in take place after he dies, we only ever see him in flashbacks as a spirit or when someone summons him. Adako, Naido. 
How does that even work? Deanne's final form summons are all villains. Fuck you, Shirakura. And Sokichi proceeds to kick their asses. But here's where we reach another aspect of Double's origins. While Philip and Shotaro have been based on the original Kamen Riders alongside Black and Shadow Moon, Skull and several other elements of Double's grander story are based on something that predates even them. The original concept for Kamen Rider came from a manga of Shotaro Ishidomori's known as Skullman. Released in 1970, Skullman is considered one of the first anti-heroes seen in the print medium, predating Marvel's Punisher, who debuted in 1975. He was a vengeance-seeking vigilante who cared a little about collateral damage. The son of a Yakuza crime boss employed by a detective agency, Tatsuo Kagura seeks to hunt down and kill his family's murderers, alongside his assistant mentor Garo. No, not that Garo. But in doing so, commits a series of mass murders all across Japan, drawing the ire of police desperate to stop him. Inevitably, Tatsuo learns the one who killed his parents is his estranged grandfather. Why? Because they were performing monstrous experiments intended to utterly destroy humanity. And Tatsuo himself is a biological weapon intended for that exact purpose, and why Garo even took him in. To use him. The manga ends with all of the involved dying in an inescapable blaze, Tatsuo's grandfather ending the madness of their family in its entirety, and saving the world in doing so. The tale is commentary on more traditional vengeance quests in popular fiction, the horrific acts by Tatsuo never validated, never justified within the story as acts of heroism. He is only the hero in the context that he is the protagonist we are following, the message of it being that revenge is the most worthless of causes and inherently self-destructive. In all honesty, he's closer to being a villain than a hero, but that would later be corrected. In 1998, Ishinomori commissioned manga artist Kazuhiko Shimamoto, a lifelong fan of Ishinomori's work known recently for Aoi Hono, a fictionalized reinterpretation of his life, to create a revised depiction of Skullman from drafts Ishinomori had prepared, one of which showcased a more heroic depiction of the character consistent with Ishinomori's other works, battling mutants created by a man named Rasputin, while still attempting to track down those responsible for murdering his family and as a result has him explore and fight against the darkest aspects of the evil that exists within humanity's soul. And then came the 2007 Studio Bones anime, which then went completely off the rails in its adaptation, trying to make it a prequel to Cyborg 009, with their Skull Man being transformed into Skull, the head of Black Ghost, who is the primary antagonist of the 00 Cyborgs. Are we noticing a pattern with Ishinomori's heroes where in modern works they keep getting turned into villains? To be fair, it doesn't actually involve the Tatsuo Kagura Skullman, but completely different characters. So it ultimately does dissociate itself from its source material, with this villainous turn and it is an insulting to Ishinomori's creations and thus utterly awful as a result. But it is still Skullman in name only. I bring this up as, in the same way that Cyborg 009 was the conceptual basis for both General Sentai and Super Sentai as the first Japanese superhero team, Skullman was the same for Kamen Rider. Toei producer Toru Hirayama approached Ishinomori after this manga was published about adapting the tale into a television show starring a heroic version of the character more accessible to general audiences and Skullman's influence would be seen again with the creation of the character of Shiro Kazumi, V3, and his origins of his family being murdered, but growing out of the vengeance obsession that doomed the original character to his grave. Once again, showing how insulting it is to think of Shaka writer Sango from Grand Prix as having any claim of being a more legitimate writer than V3. Now, some have said Riku Sanjo is doing something similar with Skull, drawing on this base manga for both the series' noir themes and for the character of Sokichi Narumi as a detective fighting evil mutants in a city experimented on by an evil organization. But with its use here, it makes that original character have a positive, influential role in the franchise through this homage instead of just ripping off a prior work or discarded concept to try and sell it as legitimate. 
As the series is not focused on just redoing Skullman's adventures with Sokichi, it never feels as if it's a derivative of that source material, but those ideas informing the series' legacy of succession, respecting it, and the overall work of Ishinomori himself and the depiction of his heroes. The difference between homage and ripoff is a ripoff fails to do anything noteworthy or meaningful beyond what they're taking ideas from. An homage uses the originating work as a foundation by which to build and explore new ideas. With many toy productions trying to evoke other content, they just repeat things already done, only worse, inserting concepts discarded for a reason, and done in ways that are ultimately disrespectful, as they say, that version supersedes inferior past ones. Sanjo, instead, is respecting these original ideas, by using them to ask the question, what if that man that hides behind a skull-shaped mask motivated others to be heroes? The Skull Man inspiring the creation of a common Rider. With Sokichi occupied, Shotaro catches sight of Philip and breaks his promise, chasing after him in hopes that this would help close the case, and as a result, be recognized by Sokichi even by a little bit, be acknowledged by the man he idolizes. Thus, the partners now meet, but Philip has no interest in him, Shotaro realizing he is the creator of the Gaia memories when Philip takes the case he's carrying, and finding inside it the double driver and instantly understanding its purpose. Where did they get that from, anyways? I highly doubt Museum made it, as they don't believe in refining the Gaia memories, as it actually weakens their power severely to do so. The only time purified guy memories are at full power are when triggering a maximum. Hell, the reason both parties aren't weaker is both Double's memories are based on words who have a strong defined concept, and Double's paired memories used together amplify their strengths. The only other option is they got it from the client who asked them to rescue Philip, which is certainly possible from what's presented later in the series with their knowledge of guy memory tech. <laughs> <laughs> but here's where we begin to see how far Philip has come as a person from where he began. So many people have been hurt by him, and he doesn't see it. Doesn't understand. I've had the better part of eight years to dwell on this, and guns are not illegal, but they are regulated in order to prevent misuse. Gaia memories act like drugs. They affect their user mentally and physically, and are ultimately harmful to them. But unlike normal drugs, it gives people the power to hurt others. Philip's analogy and argument is completely irrelevant, and disregards that they have been turning people into tools to slaughter people, all for the purpose of research. You're not making guns! This is a meth lab! It's pretty clear Philip's phrasing was done so as to remove culpability in the memory's creation, attempting to muddle the issue like a conservative up for election against Shotaro's accusation. Shotaro shoves him into a tube, losing him into the Gaia Tower at the center of the facility with Sokichi berating him for them losing the chance to easily extract him. Thus, it's his fault that everything that follows happens. The pair going up to the tower and grabbing Philip, where Sokichi is shot in the back, and dies with one last request on his lips. <laughs> This is where they first transformed, Shotaro uncertain of how to act in their body, causing Philip to take charge. Fungu. As Double originally had a seventh memory, and it switches whose body is in main control. Fungu. We'll discuss Fang later, but as a cost, Philip is unable to control Fang's power, so while they escape that night, Sokichi's body was lost in the collapsing structure, never to be found. 
ここまで戦ってきた。However, there's something to that incident Philip never told him. What made him change his ways? When Sokichi entered the tower to retrieve him, he talked him down and made him realize he was nothing more than a tool for museum. And thus, the boy of memories without his own was given the name he uses, named after Philip Marlowe from The Long Goodbye. And the moment Sokichi died saving Shotaro, Philip finally decided to make his own. He can't let Shotaro quit. They need each other. Because damn it, everything is gay about this! So it's time to catch Death and kick his ass. Akiko calling and revealing she's actually picked up how to properly tail someone and is following Asami. She's finally begun to grow up and to reflect her father, and it's thanks to Shotaro. Thus, it's keyword time. From evidence provided by Jin, they connect this to a death cult led by the priest from earlier, Robert Shijima. Please tell me he's not related to these two. They have enough evil family members. They prevent Asami from fully coming under her sway, having to break her from the delusion of her wish of reunion. Well, unless you're a protagonist, antagonist, or taking part in an asinine spring movie. In this case, however, Shijima just wanted his own private corpse party. The reunion's a con to get them here for his own personal collection. He transforms into death, once more confronting Shotaro with Sokichi, in an attempt to break him. And I gotta take another break from the movie to discuss something tangentially related to it. The character of Shotaro Hidari. The series constantly derides him as the half-boiled detective, always endeavoring to live up to Sokichi's example, and that of other hard-boiled detectives in popular noir fiction, but from the perspective of everyone else, fails utterly at that. Except, let's unbox that for a second, and go back to how Shotaro defines it at the beginning of the show. <laughs> The phrase Man Among Ben is a confusing idiom, as it's kind of be associated, thanks to the manga run one, one half, with a misogynistic, egocentric strong guy obsessed with proving himself better than everyone else as a man. But it's actually the corruption of a Japanese proverb. The flower of the flowers is the cherry blossom, the samurai is the man among men. Basically, what that phrase is supposed to mean is a man among men is a cultured, well-balanced individual with a broad range of skills. And for the most part, Shotaro is that kind of person, using a variety of talents, skills, and abilities in his detective work, and his versatility with all of the body memories likewise reflecting that he is good at adapting to situations on the fly. He's compassionate when he needs to be, tough when the situation entails. So overall, yeah, Shotaro is a man among men. Thus, the first part, not being swayed no matter the situation. Yes and no. As part of the comedy antics throughout the series, it's pretty easy to throw Shotaro for a loop when he encounters something entirely against expectations. While getting him off balance is pretty easy, his recovery shows it's simply because he's quick to react to things, but equally as fast to recover, meaning he processes information quite fast. So when the chips are down, he becomes an unmovable rock. Plus, those freak-out moments act as deconstruction peeking out of the noir setting of the show, more poking fun at the common tropes than anything. 
However, is he really being swayed, as in deceived or deluded in those moments? Not really. Part of being a noir detective is seeing the truth without bias or clouded perception, never succumbing to a twisting of reality that can hide the truth. Thus, that condemnation always rang hollow to me. Now, how does this compare to actual hard-boiled detectives? Well, the term originated to describe a type of tough guy depicted in crime dramas, but depending on the character, it can sway wildly on their traits. Most agree the concept is epitomized by Sam Spade in Dashiell Hammett's The Maltese Falcon. I hope they don't hang you, Precious, for that sweet neck. Yes, Angel, I'm going to send you over. The chances are you'll get off with life. That means if you're a good girl, you'll be out in 20 years. I'll be waiting for you. If they hang you, I'll always remember you. Thus, the most popular form of hardball detective are unsentimental, detached from emotion, carrying only a fax and a nerve towards violence. The internal narration they provide, the only sign they're even there. They possessed a burned-out cynicism and hopeless attitude towards the world. So, in the expected archetype, hard-boiled is actually more of a misnomer. The characters hardening their outward shells in order to protect a far more fragile and sometimes broken inner self. They are an empty shell, the remains of a hollowed-out person hiding how empty they are. This is present in Sokichi's characterization throughout his appearances in the series, the quote at the beginning more notable in the context of this, as both cold and kind eyes can give away the innocence or exhaustion of a person through which they may be manipulated. So to that standard, yeah, Shotaro's not hard-boiled. However, that's because he's a balanced, well-adjusted individual, which is not a bad thing at all. And there do in fact exist hard-boiled detectives who act just like that. The difference is these individuals are capable of detaching themselves from their work as they recognize how awful humanity can be. They don't shy away from the idea that someone may be corrupt or duplicitous, but either way must ferret out the truth. They know when a hardened outer shell is needed, but can otherwise cast it off to be themselves. While they can accept the reality of the world around them, they haven't given up on the world yet as there are still glimmers of light in their life. And Shotaro more fits with this stylization of the archetype. The common trait which bridges the traditional view and the less well, depressing take on the subgenre, is the lack of romanticism in favor of realism. Traditional hardball detectives are idealists who over time are crushed under their own weights. The alternative take recognizes the evils of the world and harden their inner selves against such damage. But even then, there is some crossover, as Sokichi is not entirely without emotion. The kindness and mentorship he shows to Shotaro and the warm and fighting encouragement to Philip show this. Thus, the idea being presented is, truly being hard-boiled doesn't mean being emotionless or jaded. It's to not be swayed by emotion when the moment comes to act, to not preconceive an expectation, and to follow through your beliefs with conviction. So while Shotaro does remain a goofball throughout the show, it's because he has no need to put on a mask when not on duty. It's what helps keep him sane and strong inside, where it most counts. His weaker outer shell may take damage again and again, but every time he shakes it off, heals, and becomes stronger for it. Because that soft outer shell belies that just beneath the surface, his core is being hardened and honed into the highest quality of steel. Ultimately, he is a hard-boiled detective, just not a stereotypical one, as he has yet to give up on the world and he is all the better for it. And this matters so much to this movie, and why I interrupted the movie to have this aside, as what this movie does is confront him with his idol, everything he wants to be, and challenged him, and his resolve to living by the beliefs he was passed down. Is he just copying the characters he emulates without thought? Is he really just as delusional as others who call him half-boiled claim? Or has he taken those lessons and made them his own? The answer to that can be found in one declaration. Again, 
俺の依頼人だそれがどうした自分を頼ってきてくれた人間なんだぞってさ依頼者を危険にさらすやつは探偵以前に人間として屈だ And that cinches it Both show towers resolve and his ultimate conclusion This isn't Sokichi Narumi. Anta no shi o mamoru. Sore o jama sun no ga anta jishin nara. Sore tomo tataka. Once again, fuck Kamen Rider Tyson. This is kind of the antithesis of that movie in its entirety. They engage each other, but then we have some problems pop up, and I both am, and I'm not referring to the commander Dopant's coming in as backup. There are two significant errors in the film, and they both happen in this scene. The first is Wakana still having her clay doll memory, as she had just discarded it in the previous episode. I chalk this one down to the general issue of Toei's show-related films, where the episodes they debut around haven't been written yet, so sometimes don't properly sync up. Grand scheme of the movie, they likely just wanted a show of force to complement this peculiar Dopant's ability, which in this same scene is revealed that this is not the death Dopont, but the dummy Dopont. It is capable of taking on the appearance, but not the powers, of anyone and thing. And thus, my second error, well, okay, it's more of a problem than a full error, with this movie. How did the dummy Dopont even know about Sokichi and his powers as Skull? Hell, how did he know the exact phrase needed to cause Shotaro to heroic blue screen? And for that matter, how did it mimic the powers and abilities of an advanced, refined Gaia memory to a T? And for those saying, well, he copied them from Shotaro's memory and was merely mimicking them because of the tra- No. That all worked when the enemy was trying to be the Death Dopant. But Dummy never comes in contact with Shotaro to try and read his mind before Skull appears. Hell, mind scanning is never shown to be a power of the Dummy memory, only physical recreation. Now yes, that is what they assume happens, and thus what other material says happens. But for that to be the real explanation, it's always felt like nothing but a cop-out to me. Since Shijima's other uses of the memory in the film outside of Sokichi all showcase it taking forms of things he could have just as easily researched independently to assume the form of, and that is what I assumed happened for the rest of it. Especially considering all the people he was targeting were famous. It's just far too convenient for a physical form cloning power to reach that far beyond its core ability set, when I'm more related to Bon Clay's abilities in One Piece. Especially since Museum's interest in the memory could have had them supply the Sokichi stuff to him in the event Double went after him, as by this point Shotaro's identity is known to them, in the arc immediately preceding this movie, Dummy is already active and has presumably taken Skull's form at least once from the preceding visual evidence we were given in the Q arc, and after this movie, they begin to target Shotaro actively in an attempt to reclaim Philip, with them thus knowing about his and Sokichi's involvement in the Begins Night incident to supply the expanded information about Sokichi. That all would have made a hell of a lot more sense, since Shijima, despite the movie saying that he got everything about how Sokichi acts from inside Shotaro's head, does not have Shijima in any way act like Sokichi, which is the tip-off to uncovering this whole deception in the first place. It's a fake. Though admittedly, I am in part basing my criticism on a short appearance that could easily have been placed in the Q arc as part of the advertisement for this film, and is thus a minor continuity error. And if it is, well, there goes part of my argument on this. But my point is, they don't explain it. So Kiji's presence in this film is massively significant for the closure and advancement of Shatara's character arc. Doubly so, heh, <laughs> pun, because of Double's detective theme, as part of the detective thing, is discovering all the details and presenting them in a way that makes sense to the audience. But all that breaks down upon revelation that this entire time they were fighting a faker that really should not know and be able to do what he does. At least as extensively as presented. Bad toy! Bad! Regardless, Dummy flees by turning himself into a tire, Double chasing after him, Leading into the movie war part of the film, as inferred before, I'm not recapping that now, but it's pretty much a standard heroic curb stomp with the world of the Rider War intersecting and fusing with the mainline Earth. 
bringing Double into it just as the war is at its end, and they are just wrapping up with eliminating Shocker for the umpteenth time. The only thing of note here is... And really, that part's only relevant as they recycled that suit later down the line. In the aftermath of the battle, however, and thanks for his assistance in closing the Rider War incident, as everyone departs, Tsukasa gives Shotaro a Rider card he earned during the events of the Rider War, one that gives Shotaro what he needed more than anything, to allow him to move forward. Acknowledgement from the one person that mattered most to him. He's lived up to Sokichi's expectations. They live here, in this city, bearing the memories of that day. Begins Night is fantastic. While it's irksome they drop the ball with the dummy Dopant reveal at the end, ultimately that part is forgivable as it facilitated what they needed to do with it, get Shotaro to finally confront the memories of the failure that changed his life, and motivate him to move on from it. After this event, Shotaro does tell Akiko what happened, and the Narumi Agency trio become closer because of it. Begins Night clarifies the stakes for the series and the pair's role in things, why Shotaro is protecting Philip from Museum as he's their key to freely harnessing the true Gaia memory, while also setting up new mysteries which would be answered in the following arcs. Who hired Sokichi to save Philip? Who gave them the double driver, and why was it developed? Why are all the facilities developing these memories settled on this city? It's not a film that explicitly raises further questions or contradictions with intents to never solve them, but broadening the scope of the case, once the part of it we've been thus far occupied with, has been filled in. And it also facilitates the closure of the first arc of the series, and a move to things becoming more serialized than the arc-based establishment filler that we've had up until now. So come back next time as the main cast expands and adds an officer that does not like to be asked questions. Axel! Let's go!